I had fully intended to take the occasion, Eric being appointed a deacon today, and bring a lesson on the qualifications and work of deacons. And I had it all worked out and laid out, just about ready to do what was necessary with it. And the computer just decided it would quit. And when it quit, it quit. So that we'll have to wait for a later date, assuming that it'll all be able to come back on and we can transfer to do something to it. So I just was aggravated enough late yesterday afternoon to shut it down and forget about everything till this morning. This morning I would like to bring a lesson that is as fundamental and first principle as you can get, emphasizing that whatever we do in going into more what's called the more meaty matters of the truth, leaving the milk of the word, is always going to be needful. If our fundamentals aren't right, then forget about what's going to come on because you always use the fundamentals in understanding the Word of God and rightly dividing the Word of Truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Those of you who are familiar with the Hebrews epistle know that it was written to Jewish Christians who due to great persecution were actually thinking about just walking away from the whole New Testament system and going back under the law. And the writer is showing them how that that would be a fatal decision for there's not going to be another age in which God extends salvation to man. And he shows how everything in the Old Testament pointed to Christ and pointed to the church and the last will and testament of Christ as the authority of man and the judge of man for the Christian age. Thus he appeals to them to come back to the authority of Jesus Christ regardless of of how much persecution they must undergo. So when we get to Hebrews 8 and verse 5, we find this admonition. And of course, you know, they would be very familiar with the Old Testament, especially the law of Moses. So the writer penned, Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Again, Hebrews 8, 5. There is a lot of material in that passage. The Bible many times will say the same thing in various places, but say it in different ways. The passage that's on the wall above my head, which we quote most often around here, is basically the same thing as Hebrews 8, 5. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. Moses, in his life, in faithful service to God, just read Hebrews 11, how he selected in that, by that same writer, as the Holy Spirit guided him, to be one who chose spiritual matters over physical things though there was temporary pleasure in the physical thing. But Moses is declaring here, do only what God says, or at least it's declared of Moses that he was admonished to do only what God says. Do not sidestep it. Do not step to one side or the other. Do not compromise. Make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Of course, this verse refers to the specific instructions of God that's found in the Old Testament, originally in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 9. Point being, Moses knew exactly how God wanted the tabernacle built. Why and how? Because he had revealed to him the exact pattern, or we may say spiritual blueprint. God gave it to him. God fully knew Moses had the ability to understand it. He had the strength to perform the doing of what God told him to do. Now, if there ever came a time when Moses didn't know what to do, he knew to go back to the pattern. He'll go back to the divine blueprint. 
He did not have to rely upon his own ingenuity concerning the obligatory matters regarding the building of the tabernacle. God had legislated. God had revealed. God had communicated the same on his own level of understanding. So Moses, if he made a blunder, would be the one to blame and not God. God has always demanded that his pattern or his divine blueprint be followed in exactness. We have no liberties to set aside, to alter, to compromise the Word of God. Noah, you'll remember, had the pattern of the ark. If you read uh, Genesis 6, you'll see very well that he knew exactly what God wanted him to do regarding the kind of wood to build the ark out of. As to how many stories. He was not at liberty to add another story to the ark. He couldn't change the wood. He couldn't add a window. He was not permitted to add a door. That would be adding to the word of God. God said what he meant. Meant what he said in the words that he used. Now that's very simple. But you see it challenges the likes and dislikes. And the will of man. Noah was approved of God, but now why was that the case? Well, we all are familiar with Genesis 6.22. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And so preceding the record of Moses in Hebrews 11 in the great hall of fame of faith of the Old Testament worthies, there is Noah. Each one of them, of them did by faith a certain thing. By faith they did this, by faith they did that. Notice faith operated, faith worked, faith obeyed. And that faith came by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. They had the will of God. They knew the will of God. If there was a problem, it was not with God. It would be in their own wills submitting to the will of God. Now there has been the problem ever since sin into the world. Men like to do things their way. God says it must be done my way. And you can't tamper with my word. The only real way we show confidence and trust and faith in God is to take him at his word. And to submit ourselves to him in every way. It may not seem like it ought to be this way. Or we may think this way or that. That doesn't make any difference. If we know the pattern. Then we too are admonished to make all things according to the pattern. That is as Christ is authorized. God also gave a pattern for his church. It's so easy for us to talk about his church of the Lord's church and not realize we're talking about individual members of the church we're talking about ourselves we're not talking about a brick and mortar wood structure we're talking about a spiritual building made up of people who heard the gospel who believed it and from the heart obeyed it and they were baptized into Christ thus the Lord added them to the church, to others who have heard and believed and obeyed the same gospel, which is where God locates his power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. That's the reason it should be preached to every creature throughout the world, Mark 16.15. Notice how things were done as far as giving us the pattern for the Lord's church. The Lord had to come and do what only he could do, that is, become a man, live a sinless life as a man, being tempted as we are, yet without sin. Suffer, die, be raised to the dead, and return to heaven. During the time he was on this earth, he selected certain men who would become his ambassadors after he went back to heaven. But they're just normal, ordinary, fallible men. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Read how fallible they were. Yet they exemplified a faith in him that many today don't. They would follow him whithersoever he went. They took his rebukes. They continued to follow him. There was a reason for that. 
And Peter answered when others walked away from Christ. And he asked the apostles, will you also go away? And Peter said, For, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of everlasting life. And we believe and assure. American Standard says, we know that you're the Son of God. A lot they didn't know. But they knew that. And that was sufficient to cause them to hang on his every word. To follow him. Not understanding a lot of things. Jeff this morning in the auditorium class referred to Job not understanding a lot of things and how a lot of us don't understand a lot of things about what all is going on and the workings of the scheme of redemption. But we know sufficiently enough that when we're asked, well, why don't you leave the Lord? We can respond, to whom shall we go? He has the words of everlasting life. I don't understand all there is about a lot of things. But I have adequate evidence. I have the infallible word of God. I have enough to take me from earth into the glories of heaven. If I will. And so the book is about to close in Revelation 22. And he says, whosoever will, let him come and take of the waters of life freely. So as to how we got this divine pattern. Listen in John 14, 26. In this personal, intimate, private discussion our Lord had with the apostles regarding when he would leave the earth and how they would continue to do what he had called them to do. But the comforter, and let me pause here and talk about that word comforter. It does not properly and fully translate the Greek word parakletos. We transliterate it sometimes paraklete. It has to do with another one operating with Jesus, or with the apostles, as did Jesus. But, he would be invisible because he would not be like Jesus in the flesh. If you can think about all the things Jesus did with the apostles while he was among them. And then think about the baptismal measure of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost when the church started that the apostles underwent. Then you know the kind of relationship association that the apostles had with the Holy Spirit. Another comforter. Another. You can't have one without another. First. So, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, by my authority, he shall teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. Whatsoever I have said to you. John 14, 26. I have always been impressed and amazed at that passage. That the apostles could just speak anything that the situation called for regarding the truth. Whatever Jesus taught them. It would be there for them. Never any doubt whatsoever. So he's talking about how we got the New Testament. The apostles' doctrine. There was a time when the Holy Spirit was in men. The apostles of Christ. Now it's in a book. The Holy Spirit wrote. For all scriptures given by inspiration of God. Jesus had promised to build his church, as you well know. Matthew 16, 18. And in the passage, he assures us that the Holy Spirit would deliver the divine pattern. Listen. In this same context of John 14, for it goes from 14 and 15 and 16 of the book of John. And notice the emphasis on the Spirit revealing the truth. Remember Jesus said if you continue my word Then are you my disciples indeed And ye shall know the truth And the truth shall make you free John 8 31 and 32 The Holy Spirit the third person of the Godhead Is the revealer And the confirmer of the truth So how be it when he The spirit of truth Emphasizing the fundamental work Of what the spirit's doing Is come He will guide you into all truth 
for he shall not speak of himself. For whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he shall show you things to come. John 16, 13. The Holy Spirit delivered in its completeness the gospel of Jesus Christ, the New Testament system. No, lack of better terminology, satanic agency or anybody could corrupt the divine pattern. You have the Bible in your hand, no man can destroy it. Take some study on your part. There can be false Bibles, false revelations, but God has guaranteed us the truth will remain on this earth. And if we don't know it, it's because of our own fault. On Pentecost, you had the completeness of the gospel delivered for the first time the day the Lord established His church. The scripture says of the apostles in Acts 2 and 4 that they spake as the Spirit gave them utterance. Thus the Spirit safeguarded the divine pattern and presents it incorruptible down to this time and at the end of the world. Much later, in speaking of the revelation of the gospel, the inspired apostle Paul wrote this to the church in Corinth, explaining the revelation of the New Testament. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. But then he went ahead and said, Which things also we speak? Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. American Standard carries with it the idea in its translation of comparing or combining, rather, spiritual words with Spiritual ideas of spiritual words. That's the, that's the whole point. You want to know the idea of God on something? You go to the Word of God, for there's where His ideas are found. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 13. So the divine pattern was delivered to us by the Holy Spirit. And it was of this pattern that the Apostle Paul is speaking when he writes to the Corinthians. Now we must recognize then that we have vouchsafed to us what James called the perfect, complete law of liberty that we're to continue therein. James 1.25 We can only do that by studying it, by meditating on it day and night, and seeing our lives in all objectivity and honesty in the light of it. The Apostle Paul also gave this sober warning. And it's like the one we found at the beginning, which is our text, Hebrews 8, 5, as to the admonishment from God that he gave to Moses that he was to keep, do all things according to the pattern showed him in the mount. In 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11, Paul said, For we are laborers together with God. He's speaking to the church. We are laborers together with God. Ye are God's building. So we need to think about that. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Again, 1 Corinthians 3, 9 through 11. We, saints, constitute the church God's building Paul as a master builder and apostle of Jesus Christ laid the true foundation Jesus Christ and that's according to the divine pattern vouchsafed to him and all of us by the Holy Spirit who worked through the apostles to guide them infallibly to set down the sword of the spirit which is the word of God the divine pattern Ephesians 617 our blueprint that simply says again that if we are at fault it's not God's fault and it's not the Bible's fault it's our fault he then warns any who would follow to build only upon that foundation that is according to the blueprint or pattern 
This would ensure the salvation of the spiritual building or ourselves, the church. Paul said to the church in Ephesus in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, Ye are, and then he goes on to say, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple of the Lord in whom ye are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. I think it would help as we think of ourselves as brothers and sisters in Christ to realize we are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. It might make a difference in helping us to learn to have the attitude God teaches we must have toward one another in following the divine pattern. Thus the Lord's house is built according to that divine pattern. Paul had received it from the Holy Spirit. No man taught him. He says that in Galatians. And thus he communicated infallibly the will of God. And we have what he wrote in the New Testament. As well as the other inspired writers. Paul wrote his young son, if you want to call him that, in the gospel, Timothy, these words concerning that divine pattern. Hold the pattern of sound words which thou hast heard from me in faith and love which is in Jesus Christ. 2 Timothy 1.13. Now notice, that's something I must do. Hold. Hold this bottle of water. Notice I had to take it up by my will. And do what we call hold it with my hand. One of the purposes of my hand. Well you can do the same thing. Mentally. And by your will. Doing God's will. By holding the pattern of sound words. Hold some words which thou hast heard from me. In faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy 1.13 I have been amazed all my life. People who will start off on something who think of themselves at least as members of the church. But they'll start dealing with some problem or something in their lives. And they never think to go to the divine pattern. You start hearing their own opinions come in, their own ideas. And they never go to the mind of God revealed on that subject to determine whatever it is that they need. Well, should that be the first thing on our minds? If we've got... Something that needs to be dealt with spiritually. What should immediately come to our minds? Let's see what the Bible says. Shouldn't we be recalling what the Bible says? Rather than just saying things? The emphasis. Notice this. To Titus, Paul said, In all things, not some things, All things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, that cannot be condemned. Now it doesn't mean some people won't condemn it. It doesn't mean some people won't pick up rocks and stone you as they did Stephen. But this means when it comes to God it cannot be condemned and all things launched against it will ultimately and finally fail. Paul said, but, thou, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, Titus 2.1. And he further charged that an elder must be adept in holding fast the faithful word as it hath been taught. That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Titus 1.9 number of things in that book one of them is the fact there will be gainsayers or those who undermine or attempt to the doctrine of Christ they need to be dealt with this is sound doctrine it's the blueprint we have an obligation to the church of Christ and all the New Testament means by that term to keep the church of our Lord pure and to keep the doctrine of Christ pure now notice how zealously the Apostle Paul guarded the pattern of the gospel. 
When Judaizing teachers teaching the Gentile Christians that they must be circumcised and keep the law to be saved first reared their ugly heads, here's how Paul thought as the Holy Spirit guided him and he wrote part of the New Testament about those false teachers and about the Galatians who seemingly were leaving the faith rather rapidly. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of God unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, that's the apostles, are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we've preached unto you, let him be accursed. The American standard has anathema. It means cut off. Galatians 1, 6 through 8. Now if you're cut off from God, you have no hope. That's how God thinks about those who teach false doctrine. Paul had set forth the true pattern of sound words. He had taught them the pure gospel. And now he's warning all of them against corrupting the pattern or letting anybody corrupt it. Our obligation then is to know how to ascertain the authority of God's word and to abide by it. Now why was Paul so firm about this? Well, listen to him. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Galatians 1, 11 through 12. Paul was showing his apostolic authority. He was demonstrating that he was an ambassador of the court of heaven to the earth. He would defend his apostleship and in... Corinthians, when he did it, 2 Corinthians 12, 12, he said, you know I'm an apostle because truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you. He didn't claim something he couldn't prove. So Paul was set for the defense of that pure pattern or sound doctrine or gospel as he told the Philippians, the Philippians 1 and verse 17. We've had many times people point out that that word set for the defense is like concrete setting up. That's how stalwart he was for the defense of the gospel. So his blueprint had to be faithfully followed without addiction, addition, subtraction, or alteration of any kind. So what then should be our attitude toward any who would change or alter this pattern or blueprint? Or bring reproach upon it by their own conduct? Well, listen again to John. In 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth, the American standard says, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. You don't have to believe the doctrine. Just encourage somebody teaching it, and you're a part of it as much as the one who teaches the false doctrine. This sounds to a great extent like the verse we started with is our text. And that is that we're to make all things according to the pattern, even as Moses was admonished to do that. And that was said in the New Testament letter to remind them that they were to abide in the New Testament of Christ by its authority. Ignoring or rejecting this divine pattern that God's given for His church, the gospel, its organization, work and worship of the church, has given rise over the years to all sorts of pernicious and devious innovations. There are those churches existing that evidently were built to a different pattern or they've spurned the pattern and gone to something else. Many practices in these churches do not conform to the divine pattern that the Lord gave us that we have even now. Many acts of worship are not found in the original pattern that are offered by inspired men. Many doctrines being widely spread today are in opposition to that which God revealed by the Holy Spirit and you have it in your New Testament. Now, in view of all the religious chaos and confusion round about us, and it's gone on for years, the end is not yet by any means. And the worth of your eternal soul. 
Don't you owe it to yourself to do some serious checking on the original pattern and examination of yourself in the light of it and set your religious house in order if necessary. Can we find the church of your choice in the divine pattern? Can we find the idea of infant membership in the divine pattern? Can you locate the authorization of mechanical instruments of music and the worship of God in the divine pattern? Can you find uh, observing the Lord's Supper two or three times a year or any time you want to in the divine pattern? Can you find counting beads and lighting candles and wearing robes and all sorts of things like that in the divine pattern? That's why many times we refer to the Christianity that appears on the pages of that divine pattern to be simple, pure, primitive, New Testament Christianity. Even in our earthly home, we want to be sure that the builder follows the pattern. If the blueprint calls for a two before, we, we don't want an eight by six or so on down the line. We're concerned about blueprints and things of this life. We're concerned about patterns and things of this life. So God chose that to say there's a pattern for things that pertain to spiritual matters. So as we emphasize this fundamental matter, as I said in the beginning, of make all things according to the pattern. You never, you never, no matter how deep you go into the study of the Bible, no matter how meaty the things are that you're chewing on, you never get away from the first principles and fundamentals. They're always there in the foundation. And on them... We examine all of the things and build on them. If you're not a child of God this morning, we always want to offer you the invitation of Christ to become a Christian. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church that you read of in the divine pattern. The church that Jesus built. Matthew 16, 18, Acts 2. To do that, you must know the terms of entrance into that church. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And faith is essential. Repentance is commanded, Romans, uh, Acts 20 and, uh, well, I'll get a minute, Acts 17, 30. It's commanded there. It's not a suggestion. Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. The confession of one's faith is taught. It can't be dispensed with. It's in the divine pattern. And being buried with your Lord in baptism by the authority of Christ for the remission of sins is in the divine pattern. And that's likely several of you, if not most of you, have done that. But you see, that just gets you started. Now you've got most of the New Testament teaching you how to live the Christian life. It's the divine pattern that says, here's how you live in the church. There's a second law of pardon for those in the church who sin. It's repentance, confession of sins, and prayer to God for forgiveness. And thus we've set forth in this brief time the importance of the authority of the Scriptures and that the New Testament is the divine pattern and that we are to do all things according to the pattern. Concerning the plan of salvation, concerning God's second law of pardon, concerning faithfulness in the church of our Lord. Now are you subject to the invitation of Christ? If so, then we ask you to come while we stand and sing.